My name is Tanya Beer. I am from the Center for Evaluation Innovation in Washington, D.C., and I have never been constrained to 20 minutes or less, so I'm starting immediately. And I'm just going to jump right in. Um, the center, just briefly, the Center for Evaluation Innovation is a small sort of think tanky style group that works a lot with philanthropy and evaluators to build the field of evaluation in areas that are difficult to measure. So advocacy, obviously, is one of those things. And for those of you in the group, I'm going to talk today about measuring impact in advocacy and policy work. And for those of you in the room who are evaluators, I have to give a disclaimer, which is that for us, um, impact means something very specific. But what I have found is that foundations and philanthropy in general likes to talk about impact as a sort of stand-in concept for what changes are we causing. So that's the sort of larger scope of thinking that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and I also want to say before I get started that um, as I talk about advocacy today, I want to be sure that we're all on the same page about the full scope or range of activities that kind of fall under that umbrella. So when I talk about advocacy, I'm talking about any activity that is an effort to shape the perceptions or behavior of a particular audience with regards to public policy. So even foundations who don't normally think of themselves as doing advocacy because they don't work directly with government or they don't do lobbying are usually already doing something that is about shaping somebody's opinion or perception or behavior in relation to policy. So as I talk, I'm talking about that whole scope of activities and hopefully you all sort of see yourselves somewhere in there already. So in only tw given that I only have 20 minutes, I thought I might focus on the two things we recognize as the most common challenges for foundations who are trying to figure out this really puzzling dilemma of how to think about and measure impact or outcomes for advocacy and policy work. And the first is a mindset problem. Um, and I'm going to talk about that first. And then secondly, I'm actually going to zero in on a very usable, specific, practical tool that we have tested out in a variety of settings and find that it's really useful as a, as a way for everybody to kind of come together on the same page in how they're thinking and talking about uh, the effect that you're having in an advocacy setting. So to start with mindset. So as um, hopefully you're all familiar, uh, the history of evaluation and measurement in philanthropy grew up out of a program evaluation mindset. Um, and a program delivery mindset. And what that means is we've had some assumptions that drive the way we tend to set up evaluation and measurement that are based on stability. And the idea that in a reasonable, in any kind of situation, we can reasonably expect that a set of activities will get us from point A to point B with some really reliable benchmarks along the way. We design, we ask for logic models and theories of change often for grantees with key performance indicators along the pathway. Um, we often do dashboards uh, internally, and the, these kinds of things presume a certain amount of stability. But the problem is that in very few occasions does advocacy change actually happen in this manner. Instead, it tends to be a giant unpredictable mess. Right? So rather than leading from point A to, B to point B with predictable pathways, uh, predictable outcomes, we might hit an outcome which activates an opposition, which causes us to backslide and choose a new pathway forward. So what this means is we've got to start thinking about evaluation and measurement in ways that handle the complexity of this work. Now, there's been a lot of conversation in Canada about complexity and social change lately, so hopefully these concepts are really familiar. Um, but I, I want to talk up now about how it actually demands that we shift our mindsets and our conversations both internally within a foundation and also with grantee organizations and partners as we think about measurement and outcomes here. So I'm going to spend just this first half talking about, like really getting clear about the unique aspects of advocacy and policy work and their specific implications for how you think about measurement and outcomes before we go into tools. So as I've already said, of course, advocacy is an area of high level, with high levels of complexity. All kinds of noise, many, many players working on the same issue from different directions with different stances. But it's also the case that uh, whether or not policy change happens is affected by things that don't have a, 
anything at all to do with the topic you're dealing with. Changes in the economic situation, crises, wars, things, big things, small things that can intervene and cause your pathways to change. So this establishes a different challenge for the advocacy evaluation effort. We have a different bar or standard for what it is we're trying to do with evaluation and measurement. Many of you have probably heard this before. Rather than trying to prove the impact we have, what we're looking for is a way to make a really plausible case to understand our contribution. How do we contribute to a particular win or a loss or a bit of progress in the policy environment. The second issue we've got to grapple with extent is extended or unknown time frames. I can think of exactly zero examples of policy change where the time frame matched a grant making time frame, which is the zone within which you do evaluation and measurement. Imagine that you are a grant maker, for example, who's beginning to do work back in the 90s on uh, smoking cessation and tobacco regulation. And you have a five-year initiative. How do you think about your role in the progress towards smoking cessation and the limitations around tobacco when people have been working on it for 50 years? And you're on the shoulders of all the work that came before and all the work that's going alongside, on alongside you. And at any given day that you measure, your conclusions might be very different, whether it's been a success or a, or a failure. So as a result, although the push in philanthropy has been to really focus on the ultimate so what, the real impact we're looking for, it's imperative in your advocacy work that you get better at identifying meaningful interim outcomes that will tell us before we get to a win, what it is you're building that you can continue to build on in the future. The third characteristic that is unique is shifting strategies. So unlike a lot of program delivery, an advocate who lays out a plan, say in a grant proposal, or a logic model or a theory of change, or a group of advocates doing a strategy, lays out a plan and then sticks to it, come what may, is probably a bad advocate that in fact what we want to do is create systems that incentivize advocates to be paying really good attention to what's happening in the political environment and then shift strategies accordingly. But a lot of our habits around evaluation, measurements, <coughs> benchmarking, all of those activities tend to incentivize sticking to those initial plans. So what that means is we've got to figure out how in our advocacy funding and activities, our own activities in advocacy, to use measurement and evaluation strategies that can adapt with the same kind of speed that we want advocates to adapt with and that focus on audience change. So no matter what strategies or tactics that the grantees or you are trying to affect the opinions or beliefs or actions of a particular audience, can we detect how the audience itself is changing? Fourth, changing context and milestones. And this is a big one and kind of a, a no-brainer in some regards. Um, but it's really amazing how much it plays out in philanthropy. So um, we are accustomed to seeing measures that increase over time as sort of good indicators of our, of our impact on a particular problem. But in an advocacy context, what happens when the best thing you can hope for in a particular year is to prevent the worst from happening? Now, imagine, for example, you are an immigration reform advocate in the US in 2001, and you're this close to a policy win, and then 9-11 happens. And all of a sudden, the entire policy framework, mindset, um, the, the, what is possible in that setting completely transforms. And now advocates have to shift their strategies to try to combat what is an attack on where, where they thought they were going, right? So what this means is that you have to rethink how you interpret success. In, in many foundations, or we as evaluators have cl the cliche, right, let the data speak for themselves. But in advocacy, evaluation, and measurement, the data never speak for themselves. They are always interpreted in context, which means as you're starting to use the data and evaluation coming back from your efforts, 
you have to give enough meat to be able to actually judge what those measures mean. And then lastly, limited time and resources. Um, advocacy organizations or the advocacy work of other kinds of charitable organizations is already chronically underfunded. And on top of that, the cycle of work among advocates is much less predictable than a cycle of work in program delivery. So advocates tend to do flurries of activities around big campaigns, advocacy campaigns, around election season, around legislation periods, or the, or the legislative session in, in the US. But we set up our measurement habits at our convenience. So it, is, it can do an enormous, it, be an enormous disruption for advocates to stop in the middle of their most intense work period to provide you with a set of measures that fit, fit your grant making and measurement time cycle. So what we want to try to get people to do is unhook those two things and consider how the timing of your asks for data from grantees or your own work is going to affect the sort of cycle of intensity that they're working under. So this is a sort of a general mindset shift that's actually pretty hard to make for many foundations until they step back and think about how much your regular evaluation practices are kind of premised on stability and predictability. So I could do a session on each one of these for almost a full day, um, but because I have 10 minutes left, um, I'm going to focus on just one, which is the other place we see the most foundations sort of struggling to get started in this arena, which is the question of how to focus on the right kinds of measurements that are both meaningful and realistic given where you are. So you have a handout on your table, and the folks in the back actually don't. I am surprised that there are so many people in an evaluation session. Um, and, and so if I could ask a favor, someone from the front table, there's a stack over here on this side of the, if you could hand those out, but maybe uh, just those, just these, yes, to the back tables. And if you could just share, so there's, I have enough for the next session as well, so that you're looking at, two or three people are looking at, at one. I'm gonna share with you a really simple tool that can serve as a scaffolding to begin this more complicated and nuanced discussion about what can we reasonably be expecting given where our resources and investments are focused as a change that we should be measuring, okay? So, uh, perhaps some of you have seen this before. Um, this is a very simple framework for policy and advocacy, both strategy development and evaluation. Along the bottom, you've got three general clusters of audiences, the public, decision makers, influencers. Influencers here would be people who are positioned to influence either public opinion or decision makers themselves. So that could be the media, business associations or interest groups, uh, key leaders or other advocacy organizations and funders. Um, I recognize those are kind of big, gross, general categories, but you'll see how they're useful here in a second. Up the side, we've got this chain of awareness to will to action. We know from endless amounts of social science research that changes in action or changes in awareness do not necessarily result in changes in action. And yet we tend to fund all kinds of awareness building sort of endlessly. So there's this middle category called will that's actually made up of these, um, these five things that's really about how do you build intensity of opinion for people and make an issue really salient to their political decision making. So this progression up the side, awareness to will to action, is a rough and granted overly simplistic way of thinking about how opinions and actions change over time with target audiences. So we asked advocates to map onto this very simple framework where their tactics fall when it comes to which audiences they're designed to reach and how far you can expect them to move as a result of that kind of tactical approach. Here's why we did this. So you have it on your thing. You can see where these, these um, tactics lie. What we have found is that many funders, as an extreme example, support advocacy work that falls in the lower left-hand quadrant of this, of this matrix, public education. And yet, they ask for outcomes in the top right-hand quadrant, which is decision-maker action. 
And there is nothing more terrifying to an advocacy organization or advocate or coalition than believing that your funder does not understand the full scope of work that has to happen between awareness and a policy win. So the intention of this matrix is to help people disaggregate the kinds of tactical approaches you're using and identify, given where we are, what kinds of work we're engaging in, what are reasonable outcomes for us to expect of ourselves and our advocates. Also on that framework, on the back side, is a set of more specific outcomes that you can actually measure. So if, for example, you are engaging in tactical approaches that are designed to improve will, you should be paying attention to and measuring whether you see improved salience or changes in issue framing among your audiences. So I'm just gonna very quickly, in my last couple of minutes, give an example of how, of how this might work for a particular foundation that has a whole suite of grants that are designed to work in some way together to produce policy change. So the Annie E. Casey Foundation, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with them, so a large foundation in the US that does a lot of work in children and, family, children and families. They have a Kids Count initiative. For the first 15 years, the Kids Count Initiative engaged in strategies falling in these quadrants. And the intention was to get data into the world of policymaking around the well-being of children. How do we get policymakers to use good data to inform policies about kids and also to inspire them to action? So they were working in this zone 15, 18 years. And they were starting to get frustrated that there was, they weren't seeing a lot of traction uh, and actually transitioning from built changes in awareness and will into action. So in the last five years, they've started to fund in this zone of the, of the matrix. Coalition building, champion development, community mobilization, sets of tactics that are really designed to trigger action. So the intention here is that the Annie Casey Foundation can now think about the range of outcomes that are an appropriate mix to the kinds of strategies that they're engaging in. And it also gives a way for individual advocacy organizations to see how they're positioned in a much larger field whose work on aggregate produces policy change rather than having them feel like as individual organizations, they're responsible for the whole suite of changes. So as I close, I wanna give a couple of very quick tips for how to start thinking about this process. If you are either just now developing performance measures uh, and you're thinking about measurement in that regard, or whether you're beginning with a, thinking more thoroughly about designing full comprehensive evaluations of your impact, which requires getting clear about your, the theory behind your strategy and who should have changed along the way. So first of all, you have to prepare your board and trustees and board of trustees and staff for a shift in measurement mindset. It is a different way of thinking and talking about impact. Secondly, you have to demonstrate to grantees that you get it. Because what we have learned over the years is that no matter how many times you message to grantees that, they un that you understand that adaptation is critical, they don't believe you. <laughs> because maybe they have many other f m funders that are messaging the opposite, right? So being clear, being sure that your, your organizations you're supporting really understand that you understand the complexity of advocacy and policy work. Third, check out your current evaluation practices and see how much space there is for adaptation. Have you set up systems, dashboards, measurement expectations that are really difficult to change, either because they're too deeply encoded in complex data systems or because you have elaborate dashboards that are hard to change over time? Can you figure out how to make those systems accommodate the complexity of advocacy work? Use the framework or any of a number of other tools that are out there to get really specific about the relationship between the strategies that you're funding and the reasonable outcomes. And this is something about the humility of this work and understanding that you are operating in a much larger field. So the drive to claim credit for impact here is sort of well-tempered by clarity about who it is really that you're trying to reach and how that particular piece contributes to a larger change. 
support grantees to collect data about changes in their target audiences. So rather than having grantees, what I see often sort of produce endless lists of outputs, press releases, social media hits, um, sort of whole variety of things because it's what they know what to measure, if you can give them the resources to focus a few data collection efforts on the f information about the key audiences they're directly trying to reach, their opinions, their beliefs, their willingness to do something, that data will be infinitely more useful to you and to them than that whole array of easily quantifiable details about outputs. And then lastly, consider shifting your focus from evaluation to determine your impact to evaluation that supports ongoing learning. And there's a really, besides that this is just sort of a philosophical belief, there's a really good reason for doing this. In advocacy work, because it is complex and unpredictable, it's very rare that the full suite of lessons learned in one moment apply to every other, every other advocacy effort you're gonna use in the future. So the utility of a retrospective impact evaluation is, in advocacy work is limited. But if you focus as you go on how can you collect data about au how audiences are changing, are you building their will, who's beginning to collaborate with whom in different and new ways, it actually gives you and other advocates fodder for that adaptation that is so critical to advocacy and policy success. We are out of time. <laughs> Just to say, on your table, as you are finding your way to the second talk or staying here for the second talk, there are a couple of examples of pieces out there that you, resources related to evaluation uh, in, of advocacy and policy work. And um, there are also quite a few on the website um, that's listed on the last page of the slide. Thank you. <laughs>